Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight, which is the last in this 125th anniversary series out of the box. I'm Marcia Eli from the Brooklyn Public Library's Center for Brooklyn History and the Arts and Culture team, BPL Presents. As Brooklyn Public Library celebrates its 125th anniversary, the Center for Brooklyn History is joining in by shining a spotlight on one important part of the library's work, that is stewarding the extraordinary special collections at the Center for Brooklyn History. These archives are the combined materials from the Brooklyn Public Library and the former Brooklyn Historical Society, and they are literally the most comprehensive collection of Brooklyn related materials in the world. So we're celebrating these amazing collections in a series that puts some of the most important or frequently used or beloved materials center stage. And tonight's final program focuses on our extensive collections and materials about the history of civil rights in Brooklyn. We have the honor of hosting two wonderful um, people and distinguished historians who have both actually used these collections as they've researched their books. In a few minutes, I will introduce them. But first, I want to share these two quick notes for you. Number one, you do have the option to use closed captioning tonight. That button is at the bottom of your screen. And most importantly, I hope you'll share your questions for our experts tonight. To do that, type your question into the Q&A box, which is also at the bottom of your screen. To kick off the program and to provide a general introduction to our civil rights related collections, it's my pleasure to introduce archivist D. Bauer Smith, who's going to give a brief overview. D is a fourth generation Brooklynite and has been an archivist at Brooklyn Public Library for nearly seven years. They recently reprocessed the Re and Kirshner Civil Rights in Brooklyn collection. Welcome, D. Thank you, Marcia. Happy to be here. Um, so I think the slides are going to come up in a moment. There they are. <laughs> Um, and as Marcia said, um, I will be giving just a brief overview of um, some of the civil rights related materials that we have at CBH. Um, I did put together a list of some collection titles um, and numbers, and I think that will be added to the chat for everybody's reference. Um, but I'm also going to go through a few slides uh, just with some examples from the collection to, to talk about them a little bit. Um, so we could go on to the next slide now. So um, these are a few signs from our Arnie Goldwag Brooklyn Congress of Racial Equality collection. Um, the Congress of Racial Equality or CORE was a national civil rights organization. Um, and the Brooklyn chapter was very active and very dynamic. Um, so the Brooklyn Historical Society um, had this collection from Arnold Goldwag, known as Arnie, who was a white member of CORE. And Brooklyn Collection at Brooklyn Public Library had another collection um, from another white member of CORE, Rianne Kirchner. So it's wonderful to be able to bring these collections and these materials together. Um, at this new Center for Brooklyn History. So these signs were related to a sit-in at the Board of Education um, that CORE organized and facilitated, and um, we'll definitely talk more about it um, later in this presentation. Um, but I wanted to show these because I think that these items um, in particular really show the the tactility uh, you can see even in in the images that you know they're a little bit ripped in some cases there's tape on the edges um, the color of the construction paper has faded they're very clearly handwritten um, so this is an example of archival material where you can really feel the hands of the creator and kind of feel like you're in the room with this history and this story when you use these materials and look at these materials. Um, next slide, please. 
This is a masthead from the um, Youth in Action uh, monthly news newspaper. Um, you can see it is from 1967. Um, Youth in Action was another um, organization in Brooklyn during the civil rights era. Um, so I should say that um, Dr. Brian Purnell's book um, is about um, the civil rights movement in Brooklyn and focuses a lot on the Congress of Racial Equality. And then um, Michael Woodworth's book uh, focuses a lot on this Youth in Action um, organization. And this actually is part of our Bedford Stuyvesant Youth in Action collection, which was donated um, by Michael Woodsworth. And we also have a collection of oral histories related to CORE that was donated by Dr. Purnell. Um, and you can see those again in the chat, um, those collections and their collection numbers if you want to learn more about them. But I decided to share this in particular because I really love this logo in the top, top left that shows. Um, it shows Bedford Stuyvesant. It shows the different areas that the neighborhood was divided into for the purposes of organizing these um, programs and services that were provided by Youth in Action. And then YIA is the umbrella over Bedford Stuyvesant, protecting it from the rain. I just think that's a really striking image. Um, and I also love the graphic design of this YIA logo in this masthead. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so this is from our Rian Kirchner Civil Rights in Brooklyn collection um, that I recently reprocessed um, that I already mentioned. And this is a photograph of an action that was part of Operation Clean Sweep, which was targeting um, the state of the streets in Bedford Stuyvesant. There was no um, or not sufficient uh, garbage collection, sanitation service, street sweeping in Bedford Stuyvesant and CORE took a lot of actions to try to change that. So one of the things that they did was bringing trash to Borough Hall and leaving it on the steps of Borough Hall, which I think is a really powerful, amazing action. Um, and they also did these um, very public street sweeping activities for which they made these um, CORE aprons. Um, so Again, I think the the tactility, the the presence of these objects, where you can see the sort of handmadeness of this apron, um, the work that was happening as part of this activism. Um, so I think this is a really striking photo. Um, next slide, please. We also have artifacts in these collections. So this is a, a core hat. Um, these hats were worn to the March on Washington in 1963. Um, you might have seen one of these. We have a couple of them. You might have seen one at the Museum of the City of New York. We've, we've loaned them there before. Um, and one thing that's important about this hat and its link um, to the March on Washington is the way that it demonstrates how um, the Brooklyn chapter of CORE and its stories and its people were part of a national moment in history. Um, and tying that local history to national history is um, a huge part of our education program. Um, so let's see the next slide, please. So I wanted to show these projects from our education program because this is also a key component of how these collections get used at CBH. Um, so you can see that the students in our Brooklyn Connections program which teaches um, primary source research skills to students in fourth through 12th grade, uh, recreated the core hat from our collection. Um, so you could see that it's on display on the table in the larger photo, and then there's a detail in the smaller photo. Um, and then they also recreated the apron from Operation Clean Sweep, which is on the mannequin in the larger photo. And you, you can't see it in this picture, but they made a really amazing um, back to the apron with flames and colors, really just taking the idea of this apron and kind of running with it and making something new. And then of course you can see also all these great posters um, utilizing items from the collection as well. So these materials are definitely fodder for scholarly research at a really high level like um, Mike Woodworth and Brian Purnell have done, but they also are used and accessed by students and Brooklynites of all types. Um, and I just have one more slide. So could we see the next one, please? 
Um, these are some photos from uh, a more recent collection, the Brooklyn Resist collection. Um, and I just wanted to show these to, to quickly note um, this through line from the civil rights era and the material that we have um, from that era. And then um, the materials that we collected related to the Black Lives Matter protests in Brooklyn um, in the summer of 2020. Um, so these are three photos from that collection. Um, we also had an exhibition related to Brooklyn Resist. Um, so definitely protest and um, fighting for black lives and black rights is definitely alive and well in Brooklyn. Um, and we continue to collect materials that relate to, to that topic. Um, so that's all my slides and I will pass it back to Marcia. Thank you, Dee. Um, and I'll mention that uh, Brian Purnell was the curator of the exhibition, uh, Brooklyn Resists. And, and this gives me a um, perfect transition to actually introduce our two accomplished experts um, um, who really are, are experts on, on both the history and our materials. Let me tell you a little bit about them and then we'll jump in. Brian Purnell is the Jeffrey Canada Associate Professor of Africana Studies and History at Bowdoin College. He's the author of Fighting Jim Crow in the County of Kings, a Congress of Racial Equality in Brooklyn, which won the New York State Historical Association's Dixon Ryan Fox Manuscript Prize. And he's also the co-editor with Jean Theo Harris of The Strange Careers of the Jim Crow North, Segregation and Struggle Outside of the South. His research writing and teaching fall within the broad field of US history, with specific concentrations in African-American history, urban history, and the history of the civil rights and black power movements. Welcome, Brian. And Michael Woodsworth teaches history at Bard High School Early College in Queens, New York. He's the author of Battle for Bed-Stuy, The Long War on Poverty in New York City. There it is. Um, uh, Mike works, uh, his work focuses on the 20th century United States, particularly urban history, African-American history, and the welfare state. He holds a PhD from Columbia University and has written for numerous publications, including the American Historical Review and the Wall Street Journal. So welcome to you both. Um, this is, thank you so much for- Thank you, Marsha. Having, having this conversation with us. Um, we're, we're talking about both the history that you are both experts on and the value and meaning of our collections. And I'm going to start, before we start getting into, to digging into certain items and materials that will show, um, I just wanna, I wanna ask you both, since you've done extensive research for your respective books, you know, in the Brooklyn Public Library and the Center for Brooklyn History Collections. The broad question I have is in a few sentences, what were you exploring and how did these materials inform your research? What did you find? Let's start, Brian, with you. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, I was, researching the civil, I, I wanted to know about the civil rights movement in New York City and in, and in Brooklyn in particular. And really too, I wanted to learn about what racial discrimination looked like in, in New York City. Um, I wanted to know about racism outside of the South. So when I started my research now, we're talking like t t over 20 years ago, um, it was it was a really wonderful adventure. Um, on, but I will Center for Brooklyn History, and the Center for Brooklyn History is a combination of the Brooklyn Public Library and what used to be called the Brooklyn Collection, and now everything is what at what used to be called the Brooklyn Historical Society, and it's just you know, God, if it was like this twenty three years ago, you know, different process. But just as an example, like when I started, um, the, the Brooklyn Historical Society was closed. Like it wasn't even open. It was undergoing renovation. Documents were inaccessible. 
Um, and the Brooklyn collection, again, everything now is in one, you know, beautiful public place, but the Brooklyn collection 23 years ago was a little room on the second floor of Grand Army Plaza, like around the corner. You needed like a special knock to get in there. Um, <laughs> and, and anyway, there, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of stuff. There really wasn't a lot of material. So I, I kind of did what um, a lot of social historians do. And I started doing oral history. That's, that's what my teachers taught me to do. They, they said, you got to go talk to people. So really doing oral history led me to people's collections in their homes, um, which then, you know, finally I would get into the libraries and mostly at the time work with newspaper articles on microfilm. Um, but the, the, the answer is, what well, I was trying to find out what civil rights protests, civil rights activism looked like in Brooklyn, New York. Um, the material informed my work because it just opened up this world that I had no idea existed and I didn't really see in any books. Um, you know, now we have Mike's book, we have my book, we have all these books, but before we, before people like Mike and, and other scholars did do this work, you know, you kind of got to find it and put it together. So the, the, the material informed my ability to try to make sense of this history and to put it into a story to share with other people. Yeah, that, that it's really interesting to hear how things were back in the day. What about, what about Battle for bed Mike, and, and in your... I, yeah, I love sure. hearing the, the, the reminiscence about what things were like 20 some years ago. I didn't start quite that long ago, but it was about uh, 12, 13, 14 years ago, even when I started going to the library. Um, and I was looking for materials that would help me figure out how President Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty had unfolded in the biggest city in the country. Uh, where research had focused almost exclusively on two Manhattan-based organizations, Mobilization for Youth in the Lower East Side and Harlem Youth Opportunities Unlimited. And I knew there was a big Brooklyn story, but I didn't really know what it was. And so I spent some time looking in the collections at the, cent at the, the Brooklyn collection in the, at Grand Army Plaza. And there was a little bit, there was a bit about Crown Heights, there was a bit about Brownsville, a bit about Williamsburg, a bit about Bed-Stuy. Uh, but the um, mother load for me that I actually found there was of an organization that predated the war on poverty by about 20 years, which was called the Brooklyn Council for Social Planning. And they were really fascinating because they helped me kind of tell the policy genealogy of the types of social reform that later would, would attract the attention of uh, city policy, uh, city policymakers in the mayor's office in the 1950s, and later the federal government in the 1960s. Uh, and there was a there was a little bit of self interestedness in that research, as Brian says. It was a it was a small space, and there was but there was this little research room in the back at the Brooklyn Collection. You remember that, Brian? It was and it, and it had this this beautiful view onto kind of a leafy area of the park. And, and at the time I had, I had very small children at home and the idea of having this peaceful space to work and research um, was really compelling to me. But in order to do that, you had to be working in the archives. You couldn't just be sitting there typing stuff up or whatever. So I thought, well, this Brooklyn Council for Social Planning is a, is a huge collection. Let me work with that a bit. And as I worked with it more and more, it, it was this great treasure trove of, of stuff for me. Uh, there was a little bit that I worked with at the Brooklyn Historical Society on paper, including stuff from the Central Brooklyn Coordinating Council, which I think we'll talk about later. But there really the oral history collection was very helpful to me. There was this large oral history project about um, community development in Bed-Stuy. And that both helped inform me and helped also push me toward people who I then wanted to interview myself. Uh, one last thing to say is about this Youth in Action collection that I, that I ended up um, passing on to the, uh, to the archives, uh, that was another piece of serendipity where there was a professor at Columbia where I was doing my doctorate called David Rosner, who had been working on the history of the Harlem uh, programs. And he had been given several boxes worth of archival materials 
by a guy called Don Watkins, who had been a sociology prof in the 60s and 70s, and who had been actively involved with the anti-poverty efforts in Brooklyn. And Professor Rosner heard that I was doing this research and said, hey, why don't you take a look? And these boxes were just filled with amazing archival resources. And they really mostly helped unlock for me what had been going on in the 60s in Bed-Stuy. And then I met Don Watkins, whose materials they had originally been, and he gave me a bunch more, uh, some of which I still have and eventually will wind up in the Central for Brooklyn History Archives. You know, I really want to get into some of this, some of the materials we have. We have flyers and I want to go right to the, um, the Central Brooklyn Coordinator, the newspapers, which I know are such a important part of, of, of your research when you really roll up your sleeve. But it's a, it's a good chance to ask you, Dee, about that relationship um, where, you know, between researchers and, and archives um, and, and how it's a, it's a kind of fuzzy thing, you know, they find things and then they find the value of them and they donate it to a stewarding institution like us. How, does, how have you seen that work? Um, well, I will say, you know, um, I think it's, it's actually more rare for researchers and donors to be one and the same. Um, it, it's nice when that happens, um, but that, that doesn't actually happen too often. So it's pretty great that um, both of these amazing historians um, have given material to our collection so generously from their own research. Um, but as far as just more generally the relationship between researchers and archives, I mean, the, the researchers is why we do the work that we do. You know, um, we're, we're trying to put this material in the hands of people who will use it and learn from it. And, um, you know, like I said earlier too, that, that's not just amazing scholars. Um, it's also uh, students in, you know, middle school, even elementary school, high school, college students, grad students, um, just people in the neighborhood who wanna know more about where they live or the history of their home or their block, you know, Brooklynites of all kinds. Um, so I think that's really also where like the public library ethos comes in. Um, and we really want to be there for everyone who might want to access this material. Um, does that answer your question? I feel like I kind of yes. took a left turn. <laughs> So I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to go to um, a, a slide of um, the Central Brooklyn coordinator. And while I do that, may, and, and, and uh, that an article about an announcement that I would love to have, while I cue that up, um, Brian, maybe you can set us up a little bit and talk about Elsie Richardson and what was happening. You know, I'm going to pass this to Mike if that's Mike. okay. Yeah, she yeah. figures prominently in Mike's uh, really long history of the war on poverty. So, thank you, Brian. But I'm going to call on you too because you've you've written about her as well. Uh, what we want is bricks and mortar, right? That was an article you wrote. So, um, we're kind of jumping into the middle of the story here, but I think it's a good spot because we see how many different strands of um, Brooklyn's civil rights structure, uh, struggle and Brooklyn's uh, history of housing and the struggle for black economic empowerment uh, and as well as the war on poverty all kind of intersect. So we are looking at the January 1967 issue of the Central Brooklyn Coordinating Council's newsletter called the Central Brooklyn Coordinator. And they are reporting on a conference that happened a few weeks earlier, December 10th, 1966, uh, which as you can see from the pictures here was very, very well attended by uh, not only kind of regular folks from Bed-Stuy, but also the entire kind of political class of the neighborhood. Uh, so we see in the front row, people like Shirley Chisholm, Bertram Baker, and others who were part of this kind of rising class of political leadership coming out of Black Brooklyn. Now, what was happening at this conference ostensibly was a discussion about poverty in Central Brooklyn, led by this group, the Central Brooklyn Coordinating Council, which had been around at that point uh, for more than a decade. 
uh, something that is often kind of overshadowed in accounts of civil rights organizing in Brooklyn and in the North in general is just how deep the roots were of these organizations. And Central Brooklyn Coordinating Council was an organization that brought together, by this point, over a hundred different local organizations, including block associations, PTAs, church groups, uh, and maybe better known civil rights groups like the local NAACP uh, and CORE and, 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 the, and the likes. Now, leading it all here, is this woman, Elsie Richardson, uh, who was a, by that point, a veteran organizer in the neighborhood who knew everybody, was on every organization and had an incredibly powerful way of speaking uh, in the neighborhood and also of addressing folks in positions of power. Uh, and Elsie Richardson's most famous moment was, was a year before this in February, 1966, when she and the Coordinating Council had invited Robert F. Kennedy, who you see here seated on stage, uh, they'd invited him to come tour the neighborhood uh, because Kennedy, who was probably thinking about running for president in 1968 and definitely wanting to find a solution to the quote, urban crisis, uh, was seeking an experimental kind of starting point. And he thought Bed-Stuy would be a good place to do it. And Richardson led him on a tour and afterwards, he said that he was really eager to get started and he was gonna order up some studies of the area to which Richardson kind of famously shot back another study. Are you kidding me? We've been studied to death. I'm sick of studies. Uh, and um, maybe we'll listen to the clip and then talk about it a bit more. He or she is speaking at that conference in December, 1966. On yesterday's World Journal Tribune had an article it was headed up Kennedy low to speak here. And it started off by saying, as a first step in curing the social and economic ills. Oop, sorry about that. <laughs> On yesterday's World Journal Tribune had an article, it was headed up, Kennedy low to speak here. And it started off by saying, as a first step in curing the social and economic ills of Bedford Stuyvesant, Brooklyn's teeming ghetto, the city must find, quote, someone who can coordinate whatever federal and state help is available, end of quote. This was the opinion of Senator Robert F. Kennedy after he toured the ghetto last winter, peering into its abandoned buildings and talking to its downtrodden people. <laughs> Actually, this serves as a reminder to me of our February meeting. I really had not that you do what you have to do at a specific moment, and then you have to move on to the next problem. All right. Well, <laughs> what was, uh, what were we hearing and why were people, you know, what was that, what was that about? Do you want to take this, Brian, or do you want me to keep going here? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll... I'll jump in for a little bit and we could pass it around. Um, so, so I don't know if the audience could hear the, the there's, this was a live recording, like Mike was saying um, on this meeting uh, with uh, Senator Kennedy. Um, I think Senator, uh, well, Mayor Lindsay was there, um, maybe Senator Javits, I can't remember. Um, this was a really kind of big gathering where Kennedy was coming to Brooklyn and he was going to talk about his initiative. And, you know, Elsie Richardson, if the audience couldn't hear it, Elsie Richardson is quoting from this newspaper and is describing how Kennedy is peering through the abandoned bu buildings at the downtrodden residents of the ghetto. And the audience laughs, the audience kind of snickers and there's a pause i'm not sure if people heard that so you know the one thing that i'll say and what about 
kind of putting this into some context and adding more about Richardson. And Richardson is this fascinating figure. You can learn about her by going to some of the oral histories that the Center for Brooklyn History has uh, available online. I think there are some interviews with Richardson in the Community Development Bedford-Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation collection, which is online. You can go and look at some of the Central Brooklyn Coordinating Council newspapers that go back into the, the, the mid 1950s. But Richardson um, both wanted to call attention to the underdevelopment and the lack of services and the lack of investment in what she would always say was cent Central Brooklyn. And she also wanted to push back against the characterization of the area as a ghetto and the characterization of people living in central Brooklyn as downtrodden and pathological and somehow in need of saving. Like I just repeat what Mike said earlier because it's really important and fascinating. There, there's over a hundred local organizations in central Brooklyn, which are overwhelmingly African-American which are doing block organizing, community development, police precinct organizing, education, PTA groups. Um, there's so much activity that Richardson and others are constantly coming up against this narrative that people in central Brooklyn are pathological, they're culturally deprived, they're within this culture of poverty. And she wanted to constantly say, no, that's not true. Um, we do have needs around disinvestment and disempowerment, but we are actually very well organized and very well capable of running the types of development projects that could come to the area. So when she says in that clip, um, when she reads from the newspaper that Senator Kennedy was there to peer into the abandoned buildings at the downtrodden Black people, everybody in the room um, snickered uh, because they knew that she was speaking ironically about that characterization when, like the primary source showed in the, in the audience, it, it are like over a hundred people have gathered in this school auditorium because they're organized and empowered and invested. So that's kind of what that source is really interesting about. And if you ever come and hear it, if you ever come and use it, when Kennedy gets up to speak, he makes a reference to people being downtrodden, almost to make fun of himself. And the audience laughs. It's a really rich source. You know, I think it'd be great to get at this point into some of the, the work of First Youth in Action uh, and, and, and maybe even before then, um, your work, Mike, with maps, you're digging into maps to really understand the creation of an area, and then Brooklyn Core. So let's look at some of the, again, um, materials that, uh, That, that we have. Um, Mike, can you talk a little bit about, about what we're looking at here? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so one thing that I first learned from a book written in the 70s that I'm sure Brian knows by Harold X. Connolly, uh, I think it's called A Ghetto Grows in Brooklyn. I think that, that was the title of it. Yeah, and he, he made mention of the fact that Bedford-Stuyvesant was a relatively recently invented term. Um, there you go. And he kind of described it. And uh, I wanted to find some, some evidence for that in the sources and figure out how that had happened and when that had happened. And one thing that's interesting, if you look at this first map here on the left, uh, which was issued by the Brooklyn Council for Social Planning around 1950, there is no Bedford-Stuyvesant. There's no bed style on that map. There's Stuyvesant Heights, and then there's Bedford, but there's no bed -Stuy. And 
if you go doing research in old newspapers um, or old government documents, that tends to be pretty much the case all the way up into the 1930s and even the 40s. And um, interestingly, some of the, the residents of the area uh, had different names for it. Some people called it Stiford in the 50s. This was before the term had really been invented. And the term Stifordites was something that was, that was applied to residents. Now, the reason for that was that um, they were separate communities, Stuyvesant Heights and what was originally called Bedford Corners and later called Bedford, uh, had a lot of kind of different housing stock. They had a different character. They, they had different centers for community life. They had separate churches. And it's a pretty vast area uh, encompassing those two areas and encompassing those two neighborhoods. And it was really at the moment of the Great Migration and particularly in the 1940s and 50s as the neighborhood became increasingly black uh, that the term Bedford Stuyvesant started to grow up. And I found that for a while, particularly in the newspapers, they used the term Little Harlem uh, to apply to this area of central Brooklyn and eventually Bed-Stuy stuck. And there were all these people in the studies produced by these community organizations uh, talking about how the term was explicitly racialized at the time. So I'm just quoting from, from one study I had. They said, the definition most commonly used both by the daily press and by some residents and leaders of the community is that Bedford Stuyvesant is quote, wherever black people happen to live. Um, Elsie Richardson joked at one point, um, People, someone asked her, what are the borders of bed -Stuy? And she said, what date do you want? Uh, so it was this rapidly expanding definition that started to encompass even more neighborhoods. So the second map, which was created by the bed -Stuy Restoration Corporation in 1967, shows a bed -Stuy that includes what we would today call Clinton Hill, what we would today call Crown Heights, part of what we'd call Ocean Hill. Um, Richardson, again, had another Another punchline, and I think it's in that meeting where she said, I come from the Crown Heights section of Bedford Stuyvesant, and everybody there laughed because they knew that what she was joking about. However, this expanded definition that you see in the second map was actually used in a way to kind of foster the empowerment of the neighborhood. So if you took this new bed -Stuy, which is now this, this massive, predominantly Black neighborhood of central Brooklyn by the late 60s, that's actually sometimes said to have up to 500,000 people in it. And these organizations could then say, well, we have 500,000 people, we need X millions of dollars to serve a population the size of Cincinnati. Uh, so it was kind of a double-edged sword to have this, this racialized term of, of segregated urban space, but also a space that could then be taken uh, for the purposes of empowerment. So let's look at, uh, let's look at some of the youth in action um, flyers and talk about what that organization was and their their methods and tactics. Um, I'm going to share my screen again. Hope I could hope I shared it properly before. Uh, let me just do this one more time. You know, while while you're doing that, if I could just I I just want to uh, jump in and make another. You know, the whole program is a plug to get people to really know about the wonderful resources at the Center for Brooklyn History. But um, so there is a 1943 document. It's called the Grand Jury Report. Mike, you may have this more at your, your, your fingertips than I do. Um, but uh, it was a mayoral commissioned uh, grand jury investigation into certain social issues in uh, Central Brooklyn, and it's a 1943 report that references the area as Bedford Stuyvesant, um, and that's at the Center for Brooklyn History. You can go and read it, and it's a fascinating window into um, early 1940s social issues in Central Brooklyn that begin to kind of coalesce around the identity of, you know, where Black people are is Bedford Stuyvesant. Yeah. But that is at the collection if, if people are interested in reading that. Great. Let me, um, I'm going to advance to um, our flyers. All right. So here's, I'm going to, let's just go through all of them for if you don't, if, you, if it's all right with you. 
Um, or why don't we start? We'll, we'll go. We'll look at this one because it's so cool, and then sure. go through a few of the other ones that relate more to or, the organizing of the areas and so on. Yeah. So the, this is this is another one that is that that came to me from from Don Watkins and his collections, uh, and is still sitting in a folder here on my desk, but destined for better locations eventually, I hope, uh, in the archives. So this is this is about a, a campaign. Uh, to end racial gerrymandering, a uh, very hot button issue today, even uh, in central Brooklyn. And what you see is that this, um, what was that, was that shape? Is that a, like a parallelogram we would call that? Uh, that represents uh, Bed-Stuy. Uh, this is a slightly smaller version of Bed-Stuy than we saw a minute ago. Uh, has been cut up and is occupied by these five white, congressmen who represent portions of the district. And there was a campaign uh, led by a man called Andy Cooper, who eventually led a um, lawsuit that went all the way to the Supreme Court, Cooper versus Power, uh, to basically apply the principle of one person, one vote, as spelled out in the 1965 Voting Rights Act, to uh, Brooklyn. And this was a successful campaign and eventually resulted in the creation of the congressional district that Shirley Chisholm was elected to Congress in. So this is just an indication of, uh, of the political kind of arm of the organizing at the time. So now we get into the, the um, Citizens Committee for the Preservation of Youth in Action and, uh, and, and, and some of the flyers that they start to distribute and as they organize in the most grassroots way, pre-social media um, uh, for uh, uh, equal resources. You know, here we, here's a flyer, you know, you know that there's areas because they've talked about area three and it's, you know, they're, they're urging people uh, to fight for massive programs to clean up Garbage, waste, and filth now. Massive programs for, to provide better housing for the poor of our community now. Massive programs to provide immediate jobs for our 4,000 unemployed now. Massive programs to provide job training for our unskilled residents now, and so on. Um, uh, and, you know, it's rallies and organizing, right? Yeah, it is rallies and organizing. And what's interesting about this uh, is that this organization, bed -Stuy Youth in Action, was a federally funded and also city funded uh, government agency, essentially. It was a community corporation that was started as part of the war on poverty, uh, an outgrowth, actually, in some sense of the Central Brooklyn Coordinating Council, but with federal and city monies uh, to accomplish this goal of uh, empowering local people to take matters into their own hands and figure out how to distribute funds as a way of uh, changing material conditions among low-income people. And that's, an, that's the theoretical purpose of the organization. What ended up happening, as you saw in the previous poster, was that there were lots of difficulties getting the funds to actually get distributed. There was a lengthy bureaucratic process setting these up that we don't need to get into. Uh, and then there was always a, just a, a real disjuncture between the promises of the war on poverty and the extent of uh, economic disenfranchisement in areas like Bed-Stuy, and then the amount of money that was being spent, uh, which was always completely insufficient to, to, to match those challenges. Nonetheless, in terms of the goal of empowering people to articulate their political demands and use these organizations to foster kind of community action, you do see that that's happening. And these posters give an indication of the ways in which that's happening. And in, in essence, what happened in bed -Stuy, I mean, Brian was talking about how well organized this community was. And I think we'll talk in a minute about CORE and some of the organizing that, that had been happening in the early 60s. You see that there were people there who had already articulated these goals long before Lyndon Johnson did. And they knew very much what the problems were in their community. And they knew very much, in many cases, people like Elsie Richardson had already issued planning documents saying, what we need are these things. So here they have 
the backing of the federal government and the city government uh, with some funds, perhaps insufficient funds, but nonetheless to pursue this agenda. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I'd like to talk about CORE, but I have to show everyone this incredible flyer poster, Arise Ye Mighty People, Break the chains that bind you to poverty and oppress, and you can rid your community of rent gouging landlords. You can demand and get better mortgage insurance rates. Become a part of participate in the affairs of your community action organization, the neighborhood board, and come to this meeting. And it's just, I just, I just love this. Um, uh, so let's let's go to talk a little bit uh, now about about core um, and what what you know give us an what was core what was core uh the congress of racial equality was a uh, a civil rights organization it started in chicago in 1942 i believe it grew out of a pacifist group that's the most one of the first things about the congress of racial equality is that philosophically and uh, tactically, the national organization was committed to nonviolence. CORE grows out of nonviolent pacifists in the Fellowship uh, of Reconciliation in the 1940s in Chicago. And CORE becomes a kind of uh, anti-racism would be the word we would use now, but it, it becomes a spinoff of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, which specifically wants to address racial inequality. Um, and that's the second characteristic of CORE that's important. CORE up through 1966, 67, is committed to interracialism, uh, interracial membership, uh, interracial communities. Uh, in short, CORE really wanted through black and white committed to nonviolence, wanted to become the change that it wanted to create in American society. So again, CORE starts in Chicago in the 40s. It is primarily uh, a Northern um, civil rights organization, although there are core groups in the South uh, in the 60s, but there are core groups in Chicago and New York, uh, Philadelphia, Boston, um, uh, Cleveland uh, in all throughout the 40s and 50s, and then it really picks up steam in the 60s. And so there are core chapters all throughout New York City. There's one in Harlem, which is a really important and big one. There's one in the Bronx, there's one in the Lower East Side, uh, and there's one in Brooklyn. And Brooklyn core develops a national reputation for audacious protests, um, public demonstrations against the types of racial discrimination that existed in the North. Uh, they're masterful at, at attracting media attention. And for about five years or so, um, they're one of the hottest protest tickets in town in terms of civil rights demonstrations um, outside of the South. Mm -hmm. So um, we have in our collection, a lot of very powerful letters. Um, uh, from white people resisting, in particular, uh, the, the effort to have fair and equal education. Um, I wanted to, again, go back to sharing um, and look at some of those, Brian. Um, yeah, and well, while you're queuing them up, um, you know, and, and Dee could speak to this a little bit too, I hope later, you know, um, one of the members of CORE, Dee mentioned this person earlier, Rianne Kirshner. Rianne Kirshner um, uh, was born in England, uh, lived there during uh, World War II and the, bo the bombing of London, moved to Canada and then eventually moved to New York and, and worked as a librarian uh, in the early 1960s. And then later, many, many years later, um, Rianne Kirshner was volunteering at the library. Um, that's when I met her in the late 90s. Uh, early 2000s. And one of the things Rianne did was she actually photocopied from the microfilm local Brooklyn newspaper articles about school politics and school integration. So there's there are dozens and dozens of local, local Brooklyn newspaper articles. Um, you know, Brooklyn 
uh, newspapers from from uh, Brighton Beach and Sheepshead Bay, uh, Manhattan Beach. Like there's all these local articles that she copied around racial integration of schools throughout the 1960s. And one of the things that you see in these newspaper articles, if you ever just wanted to go to the Center for Brooklyn History and just go through them, um, you know, again, you can't, you can't really, uh, you can't do an internet search for this stuff. Like these newspapers aren't online. They're, they're on microfilm and somebody had to actually, um, she had to print them all out. Anyway, one of the things you see from these Brooklyn newspapers is how much um, resistance, how much anger, how much debate there is amongst white Brooklynites about uh, racial integration of schools. It was, a, uh, it was a third rail political issue. It was highly contentious. And so what we see here is um, a letter, a handwritten letter that somebody sent, uh, a person named Mrs. Uh, J. Shapiro, you could see it down there, sent this to the Brooklyn Core chapter, which was located in uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant. Um, and this is one of the types of uh, examples of resistance um, and, and um, disagreement around racial integration in education that's, that, that, that is in the Arnie Goeg collection. So I'll just read parts of this. And this one isn't, you know, I mean, there's some really nasty, you know, racist, you know, nakedly virulent uh, uh, condemnation in these sources. Here's This one is a minor disagreement about the politics of racial integration. So it's directed to Mr. Leeds, the chairperson of Brooklyn Corps, forced integration merely to balance the number of white and Negro pupils in public schools is unfair and unconstitutional. It has been mandatory for all to attend schools nearest home. This policy is the only just and sensible solution. I'll stop right there. See, what, what this highlights is the ways that white Brooklynites wanted to protect the neighborhood school policy which meant that kids would go to school where they were zoned, which I mean, you know, maybe you agree with it, maybe you don't. But one of the challenges was that the investment in school resources with, within predominantly black communities was so insufficient to match the need that schools in predominantly black sections of New York City and Brooklyn in particular, um, were just bursting at the seams. They would cycle students around the clock to go to different shifts for schools. And all of this was happening while there were underutilized schools in predominantly white areas within the borough. So when Brooklyn Core is organizing to racially integrate uh, underutilized schools, whites in Brooklyn are counter demonstrating by wanting to protect and hoard uh, the cherished resources that they have in their underutilized schools, which are overwhelmingly white. There was a question in the chat about PTAs and the work that PTAs did. And it was by Heather Lewis, um, who's a wonderful scholar who's written about, um, let me hold up. See, Heather's, Heather's book is on my desk too. This is just you know, this is, we're working, we're working scholars so that I got this stuff at my fingertips. Heather asked this really good question about PTAs and the role of PTAs. And I would just say that is a really, really under-researched subject. Um, it would be fantastic if people came and worked with D, came to the CBH and did more research on PTAs. We know that they existed. We know that black PTAs were organizing to try to bring resources and bring organization to black schools. Um, but really it was an uphill battle. And in part because there's a lot of resistance against trying to equalize resources uh, in education in, in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Let's look at some of the um, flyers relating I, to Bebald. Can I just add one? Yes, thing about of course. Our, there is a, um, an, a, an amazing document in the Youth in Action Files called uh, Education and Urban Poverty, a research essay on education in bed -Stuy. Uh, which I have a copy of here by Don Watkins, uh, whose collection the Youth in Action papers were uh, from 1965. And he did, uh, as a sociologist, a very rigorous kind of study of levels of educational achievement at all of the schools at all of the levels in Bed-Stuy. 
And he, you know, one stat that he cites is that the highest average Bedford Stuyvesant junior high school eighth grade achievement rate is 6.6 grade, 6.6 years. Um, and he compares that to um, nearby middle income areas. Uh, and he says that there, there was no junior high school in bed where the average eighth grade student had reached the average sixth grade student in the middle income areas and concludes the study saying that the educational landscape is a quote, tragic waste. Uh, and it's a really arresting study. Um, and so you see that that's, that's education is a target for core. It's also a target for the, the poverty programs as well. Yeah, and this is, that was, that was really, it's so important just to realize how long-standing these issues are and how even though there's activists who might not be in the same organization or not even working at the same time they're they're really kind of uncovering the same truths and promoting them at a lot of different levels so this is a great um source uh you know again this is one of these kind of handmade hand typed um you know uh, uh um information leaflets um brooklyn core put this one together to illustrate exactly what Mike just said. Um, you know, they went and tried to do research on the, the reading levels um, for the different predominantly black and Puerto Rican and predominantly white schools that they were comparing them with. And this was one of the sources of fact that they tried to use to illustrate to people who might've been suspicious of the claims that they needed to desegregate education or that this was really trying to rally people to the cause too. This is an example of a source that people used 60 years ago to really try to show the inequities within the school system. And then you can see at the bottom, it says, you know, what can you do about it? Um, so there's always the attempt to highlight the problem and organize and mobilize to try to bring redress to the problem. I'm going to go to this photo. Brian, um, so um, we can hear a little bit about what the Beebold family was protesting and who they were. Yeah, very, we can show the flyers. Very brief, you know, this is uh, the Beebold family. Um, uh, uh, I don't know if it's left to right or am I looking at it with Elaine Beebold on the left? I, yes. I don't know, okay, because we are in the Zoomiverse. So I don't know if everything's switched around. So this is the Beebold family. Uh, Elaine Beebold is on the left. Her husband, Jerome, is on the right. And then they are sandwiching their three children. Next to Jerome is the eldest, Douglas. Uh, in the middle is the middle child, Carrington, and the young sister, Melanie. Um, this was a, a, a family. Um, they were members of Brooklyn Court. They weren't um, incredibly active. They attended meetings. They created leaflets. They did flyers. But they didn't really get involved until um, they themselves became um, affected by the inequities in the school system. So long story short, they lived in a section of Crown Heights where their children, so Elaine is black, Jerome is white. The children, I guess nowadays would be called interracial, but that's not how they grew up. They grew up as black children. Um, that was one of the things that Jerome and Elaine, you know, agreed upon in raising their kids. But at one point they lived in a section of Crown Heights that was still kind of mixed blacks and whites, and the kids went to a great school. The kids had resources um, uh, to go on special trips. They would do all this kind of accelerated work, but then the family had a fire and they were forced to move. And they actually had to move to a section of Park Slope um, that was on the border of a black and Puerto Rican area and a white area, but the schools in Park Slope were predominantly segregated along district lines by um, blacks and Puerto Ricans in one and whites in another. And I always try to tell audiences like this wasn't the, this isn't the park slope of today. This is the park slope of 1963, which was a poor working class, you know, interracial community that had some separate pockets by race. Anyway, when they go to this school in Park Slope, the students have inadequate resources. They're not doing um, accelerated work anymore. Douglas, the oldest, he actually starts mumbling to himself in class because he's so bored. And the teacher's response is to tell the parents that he may need special education. 
Um, so Elaine kind of hits the roof. She's like, how could my kid go from accelerated classes, you know, two months ago, and then we have a fire. And now you're saying he needs to go into a special education class with kids who have learning disabilities. And she brings that to the Brooklyn chapter of CORE. She says that she needs help. And true to Brooklyn CORE's style, they develop a research program and that launches into this direct action campaign, which involves parading through the streets, um, protesting at the Board of Education, sitting in at the Board of Education. Uh, if you could go back to that other picture where they're, 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 they're parading through the streets, um, calling for the bury of Jim Crow, the burial of Jim Crow education. So this is one of these ways that activists in the North, core activists, highlighted through public demonstration, through uh, protest theater like this, um, through highly visible tactics, they brought attention to these rather insidious, somewhat hidden, some might even say like that letter that we read earlier, natural outcomes of social policies. Brooklyn Core was trying to say there's nothing natural about racially segregated schools. That's a reflection of choices. And they're trying to use the demonstrations to say, we can make different choices that bring more equity to the public education system. So this was one of their campaigns. It was a, it was a dynamic one. Um, it, was a, uh, uh, it was an attempt to also build bridges with Puerto Ricans. Can we show this, the two different, again, handwritten mimeograph type flyers? This is a flyer that they wrote in Spanish calling attention to the Beeble campaign. And then there's an English uh, um, translation of it. They're calling attention to the ways that when the Beeble family kept their kids out of school, the courts held them in violation of the truancy laws. So the parents were actually gonna get sent to jail if they didn't send their kids back to the Jim Crow school. So Corey used this as a way to try to galvanize black and Puerto Rican and whites in Brooklyn to come together around education equity. Powerful. Um, uh, some of these, we won't have a chance to get to all, you know, all of these, but as a sort of final note before we wrap up, I think it's worth talking a little bit um, about the Black Power Black Nationalist newsletters that we have um, and, uh, you know, and how their covers speak, what their covers, what their covers say. So let, let me just go to those um, and then we'll, we'll wrap, we'll show some of those and, and, and then wrap up. Okay. Yes, so sir. Yeah, I'll just make a comment or two and, and, and make a bridge to Michael's to Mike's really important work, right? So the late 60s are this dynamic time of Black politics, um, Black cultural efflorescence, and Brooklyn is, you know, an epicenter in the African diasporic world for, uh, you know, Black power uh, culture, especially around music, especially around jazz. Um, but there's so many things going on, right? Like these are covers. This is a cover from Black News. Black News was a publication that an organization in Brooklyn called The East produced. The East grew out of the struggles for community control that centered around Ocean Hill Brownsville, 1968, 1969. So you can do some connections between community organizing in the 50s through the Central Brooklyn Coordinating Council and Elsie Richardson, the Block Associations, the PTAs, you can go to the direct action protests of the 60s with CORE. You can go to Ocean Hill Brownsville and the community control effort. And, and, and you can also see Youth in Action from 1964, 65. It's all gonna kind of come together and really just explode in this tremendous outpouring of organizing and activity and culture and ideas. These covers come from a black nationalist, black power, organization that wanted to draw attention to their criticisms 
of policing, of culture, of education, of politics. And this was one strain of black power in Brooklyn. Other strains of black power, Mike can talk about coming out of the community development, economic development, economic empowerment efforts that also really blossom uh, and become an epicenter in Brooklyn for national directions around anti-poverty um, and economic development work. So there's many black powers. There's many different examples of black empowerment. These are one and, and Mike's work really puts a highlight on, on another. And um, yeah, Brian, you're absolutely right about that. And there, in these, these different strands, you often see the same individuals participating in organizations that represent these different strands. So for instance, um, the main editor, I believe, of Black News was Jitu Weusi, or one of the main writers in Black News, at least. Uh, and he'd formerly been known as Les Campbell. And as Les Campbell, he was one of the, the most important players in the Ocean Hill-Brownsville struggle, which I see somebody asked about in the chat. Uh, the Ocean Hill-Brownsville struggle, which was going on at the very same time as the struggle for a Black run and uh, Black attended community college in central Brooklyn, uh, the archives of which uh, were also part of this large Don Watkins collection. And maybe, maybe Marsha, we could just look for a second at that, at that poster since it does connect to some of what we were talking about with education. Which poster uh, are you looking for? The poster for? about uh, the, uh, the, the, the community college. Ah, uh, absolutely. So it, what Brian was talking about with these various different organizations coming together, uh, one, of, one of the moments, the kind of signature moments where they came together was in this struggle to have a community college be placed in Bedford-Stuyvesant. And this was in response to a variety of factors. It was happening at exactly the same time as the Ocean Hill-Brownsville struggle. Uh, and many of the same people were involved. Uh, and one of, the, one of the reasons for it was because of this so-called educational waste in the schools of Central Brooklyn for Black students, uh, almost no Black students were ending up qualified to go to the city community colleges. And so one, one of the pushes, uh, and this is uh, before CUNY open admissions came into play, one of the pushes was to have a college in Bed-Stuy that would, as you can see, um, give people a voice in planning courses to be taught in our college, uh, to allow people in the community to determine how money would be spent. Uh, and this was a long struggle that uh, is, you know, it's in my book and, and other historians, including Steve Breyer, who I think is in the audience here and who used these archives as well. He's, he's been writing about this. But what, what it did was it brought together all of these different organizations, people from across the political spectrum within the community, uh, from the, uh, types of people who would be uh, writing in Black news, you know, the, 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 the real nationalists, uh, to the much more kind of reformist politicians, uh, people within the poverty programs and the likes. And, and this was a, a, a moment where outrage at the lack of resources was, was able to bring people together and bridge the gaps within the community. Uh, and again, this, this poster is advertising a mass community meeting. And at that community meeting, they brought together an organization called the Bedford-Stuyvesant Coalition on Educational Needs and Services, which provided a huge documentary trail, uh, which I hope will be at the Center for Brooklyn History soon enough. Um, I'm having a meeting with folks tomorrow to talk about getting those, getting those archives there. So I hope that happens. That's great. You know, I mean, we could talk about this for a really long time. There's so many roads to go down and threads and so much history and so much, so many materials that we can show, but um, we'll have to do another one. You know, I just, in going through all of this, I just picture you guys with your boxes going through and finding these and saying, whoa, look at this flyer. You know, I mean, is that how it is? when you do this work? Uh, it can be. I mean, uh, I guess I'll conclude by saying, you know, I, I haven't seen it yet. It's at the New York Historical Society. I think we can be, you know, ecumenical yeah. and friendly. And Absolutely. But there's an exhibit at, on Robert Caro, uh, who's one of my favorite, you know, authors and nonfiction writers. And um, 
you know, he Robert Carroll had a has a saying where he says, um, turn every page, right? So, you know, when you're doing research, he, that was his way of saying, make sure you look at everything in the box. So some sometimes there's those moments of like, oh, wow, this is amazing. I didn't know about this. And I've been thinking about this. Uh, sometimes it's a lot of just, you know, turning the pages um, and just going through a lot of stuff um, to try to see what it means and try to make sense of it. And I mean, thank all the gods for, you know, people like Dee uh, who arrange and describe and, you know, organize this stuff because it's a real mess before a professional gets a hold on it. So um, I would say it's it, it can be a slog sometimes, you know, like it can really be laborious. Uh, but when you do find that thing that you didn't know you were even looking for, it's it's magic. It's I don't know. There's it's 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 one of the best feelings in the world. Um, it's exciting, you know. To you feel you really feel like you're discovering something mm -hmm. um, that has been there all along, though. What about you, Mike? I I will I will uh, follow up on the notion that 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 it is a slog at times and uh also my utter amazement at people like caro and that they can do what they do uh, my experience of going to the lyndon johnson presidential library was one of just abject failure uh, i was just defeated by the millions and millions of documents there i didn't even know where to start looking and uh eventually thought to myself well actually Johnson's not what I'm so interested in. In fact, it's the, it's the community level that interests me and whatever the feds are doing is, is interesting, but maybe more accessible through, through other sources that are easy to get to without going through those millions of documents. But Caro did it, so more power to him. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the moments of discovery and serendipity um, can involve going through the archives, but uh, Brian talked about oral history earlier. Uh, they can involve meeting people out in the community. And um, I was lucky, I think, in my research to have been able to meet people like Elsie Richardson uh, before, very only months before she died. Uh, I probably, if I'd gotten to my research earlier, and I don't know if Brian, you had the same experience, probably could have met a lot more people than I did uh, because it was already 45, 50 years later at that point. Uh, but some of those meetings were really magical moments for me uh, and hearing folks talk about events in a way that didn't leap off the page, even if their memories were maybe a bit fuzzy, uh, that, that was amazing. And again, I'll just, I'll just talk about the incredible oral history collections that are available um, at the Center for Brooklyn History, not only in the kinds of things that, that Brian and I study, but the, you know, the history of, of Muslims in Brooklyn, for instance. Um, and various other subjects. So that can also be uh, a moment of real magic for a historian to hear those voices um, telling those stories. And Dee, do you have any final thoughts um, from where you sit working with uh, the archives so closely and processing and making sure that they're accessible to folks like Mike and Brian and all of us? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think you saw I put in the chat when Dr. Purnell was speaking about, um, you know, the slog and then the magical moments that happens with archival processing too, um, definitely. And I'll also note that um, things aren't always a mess when we get them. <laughs> I mean, frequently they are, but not always. Um, but yeah, I, I do, um, I always just love to see the results of research in our collections. It, it's amazing. Um, and um, I think it's a really special relationship between archivists and researchers. And um, I'm so glad to have been able to participate in this panel. So thank you, everyone. And I want to thank you all um, so much for this conversation. It, 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 it does feel like it, we could have a follow up or two or three or four. Um, because there is so much to talk about in terms of the history and the materials. Um, but we can't right now. We're gonna <laughs> we're gonna um, wrap it up and, and I want to thank you so much for being part of it. And I want to let everybody know that this has been recorded um, and it will be posted 
on the Center for Brooklyn History YouTube page tomorrow. Um, and also that we have a lot of other programs coming up. And since we're talking about oral history so much, I have to mention one program that's coming up on May 25th, which is in fact a dramatization um, inspired by a number of our oral histories from the Voices of Crown Heights collection, along with uh, essays written uh, through the Center for Black Fiction at Megar Evers, uh, elders, and that's their term for themselves, uh, writing group, um, has written their personal memoirs and essays about growing up in central Brooklyn. Woven into all of that are poems from current Megar Evers students, and it is a theatrical piece with professional actors and so on that brings this history of central Brooklyn to the public in a very different way through um, theater. So I hope that um, some of you might be interested in coming to that. Um, mostly, I wanna thank again, everybody for, um, for, for being part of this conversation and for you know, ending this series that I hope will actually have a second round out of the box. There's so much more. Um, it's been a really amazing conversation and I'm honored to have been, been with you all. So um, on that note, I wish you all and everybody else out there a really good night. Thank you.